Thank you for joining us for the Health Professionals Guide to Screening, Brief Intervention, and Treatment, Part 3. Part 3 is going to focus on referral to treatment and follow-up. This webinar is hosted by the Big Hospital Effort Initiative, and welcome everyone. I'm Tracy McPherson. I co-lead the Big Expert Initiative with Dr. Goplaroon. Both of us are at the University of Chicago, NORC, here in Bethesda. I provided you with my contact information here. Please don't hesitate to contact me uh, following uh, the webinar. At any point, should you have additional questions about the material that we cover here in Part 3, or any of the material that we have covered in Part 1 and 2, which I encourage you to, um, to view at, at your leisure. Uh, both of them are up and available online, uh, complimentary, and we will have a link to the website later on in the webinar so that you can access those very easily and share those with your colleagues. But please, uh, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions about any of the material that we've covered in this series. The webinar is based on a collaboration. We have uh, brought together leading professional associations, uh, nonprofit organizations, and expert sites to develop the content that uh, has gone into developing this webinar series as well as a learner's guide that we have recently released called the Health Professional's Guide to Screening, Brief Intervention, and Treatment. And all of the partners that you see here have contributed significantly uh, to the development uh, of this, and we are very grateful for their collaboration. The objectives of this training in Part 3 we hope that by the end you'll feel more comfortable in being, being able to provide referral and facilitate linkages to treatment using some of the motivational interviewing strategies, some that you may be using already, and some that we uh, covered in part two. So I would highly encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to look at part two, to, to after this webinar, to go back and, and take a look at those motivational interviewing strategies and think about how we can use those, not just in the context of brief intervention, which is how we position them in part two, but but how can we also use those MI strategies to facilitate a conversation around referral and linking people with higher levels of care? And we also hope by the end of this training that you'll be more comfortable in providing continuing care, follow-up for patients who screen at risk. And we have a number of uh, materials and resources that are downloadable from the website. MISTI has provided uh, links to those. Um, they are, uh, there are a number of them that talk about um, referral and sample protocols uh, that include scripting around how do you talk about referral. And I'll give you a snapshot of what those look like later on, as well as some other resources about uh, mutual support groups and so forth. And we'll be referencing those throughout. So if you have the opportunity to bring some of those up now or to print those out uh, before uh, we get too far into it, it might be helpful to have those to, to follow along. But we'll certainly show you some snapshots. So if you don't have a printer, uh, you'll still be able to follow along uh, quite well couple of housekeeping items. We will open up the session for a Q&A following the webinar presentation portion. And as I mentioned, these are all going to be recorded in archive for future access. Also following the webinar, we are going to be sending you an email with a link to a very brief evaluation form. And your feedback is, is really valuable in helping us to shape our, our webinars and our training, and to help uh, make sure that we're providing you with quality resources and information that can really help you as you are implementing SBIRT in your own setting. So uh, please uh, take a couple of minutes. I'd probably take you less than a minute, but it would be um, very valuable for us. So this webinar series is really an introduction to SBIRT. 
expert and something that um, would be a nice starting place uh, for those in your organization who are really early on, as well as those who may have been sort of dabbling and getting used to integrating different pieces of it, but it may not be coming quite together uh, and need additional training and in the screening and the brief intervention and the referral to treatment pieces. So it's a nice introduction for people who are in a, uh, along the continuum of learning. So we hope that you will share this uh, training with them and make it available throughout your organization. And this series is really looking at unhealthy drinking from a public health and, and safety issue. And we're providing really a 35,000 feet view of alcohol screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment, or ESPERT. It's the leading way to really help reduce the impact of unhealthy alcohol use. And so we've, we have uh, broken down for you in the three-part series um, the whole process of screening. And we, if you haven't had a chance to view that, we talked a lot about uh, the audit screening tool with the audit C and the audit. And we're going to talk about that today and how do you use the, when you determine that someone is at high risk from screening using the audit or another tool, how do you move from the brief intervention into the referral to treatment and how do you have that conversation? Also in part one, we talk about the single item screeners from NIAAA and NIDA, the craft tool for adolescents the DAS drug tool, the ASSIST tool. So we hope that you will uh, take a look at those and learn more about how to interpret those and determine the level of risk, and then also to help determine the level of brief intervention. And in part two, we talk about how do you, what is the, the intensity of the brief intervention, and how do you match that to the level of risk as determined by the screening. And we talk a lot about behavior change and moving people along uh, using a, a patient-centered, motivational interviewing style, um, both to move them along in behavior change, but also in, in their cognitions, their thought processes, their readiness to change, to help them reduce, to cut back um, their unhealthy drinking, and for some individuals, it may be to stop altogether. And then now in part three, we are going to talk about linking uh, your patients to specialized addiction treatment and staying with uh, the patient to, to support sustained success and how to, how to have a conversation um, about referral, how to make the linkage, what are the uh, uh, supports that are out there, what are the menus of options around treatment resources, and we'll point you to some additional resources uh, that you can uh, take a look at after this webinar that go into even more depth about some of those topics. So part two, we just, I just gave you just a real high level part uh, of a recap of the full series. But let's recap the brief intervention and, 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 and the uh, use of that screening tool, the audit in particular, to determine the brief intervention level. And what were those components that went into that that would warrant an, uh, a uh, referral to treatment? And really, who are the patients that will be talking about that where referral to treatment is, is the most uh, appropriate and certainly the most warranted? We were defining brief intervention as a behavioral change strategy that's relatively short in duration and length, and that it's aimed at helping a person reduce or stop a problematic behavior. And we talked about it can be the cutting back on drinking or abstaining, but it could be that the brief intervention was focused on not engaging in risky behaviors, getting behind the wheel of a car or getting behind the wheel or getting in a vehicle with someone who has been um, consuming alcohol or engaging in, in drug use. A brief intervention may include also talking about referral. So, we have to keep in mind that this may be the one opportunity that you have to talk to someone. We don't know if we're going to see that patient again. And so as a part of that brief intervention, the behavior change may be cutting back, but it may be about the behavior change is taking that next step and connecting with that referral source, seeking treatment, motivating them to initiate in that first appointment or motivating them to engage by going back to a second appointment and staying with 
um, uh, with the, the treatment modality or that they're already in. So you're going to be uh, encountering patients who may have never even thought about treatment or may not even know where to seek treatment. Or you may encounter people who have uh, been through that process before. And so there are different ways um, that you can, you can use this brief intervention opportunity and, and thinking, what, what if I'm going to have this three minutes with this person, what is it that's going to be the most valuable to focus on? And maybe it's one of these, maybe it's a combination of these. So we also talked about the elements of the brief intervention providing feedback around their screening score, their level of risk. What does that mean? And comparing their results to the national averages. So they have an understanding about how their use and their level of risk compares to other adults their age. And we talked about uh, expressing concern and about the potential effects of unhealthy uh, drinking and providing advice to cut back on unhealthy drinking. And we talked about exploring the pros and cons of, of uh, their, their unhealthy uh, alcohol use. We also talked about action planning, helping them to at least identify um, one thing that they can do going forward, a step, a smart, a smart goal, um, and then to help support that and, and to motivate them and gain commitment to action. So here you notice I'm talking about this in the context of cutting back um, and exploring pros and cons of use. Well, you can use these same elements to talk about referral. When you're talking about, for example, expressing concern, when you're talking about some, with someone who is at high risk, you would want to express concern and express concern about uh, the need for seeking additional services providing some simple advice. So the simple advice in the context of referral is, is suggesting that they would connect with a referral source or suggest they would um, consider a menu of options in treatment or higher levels of care. Exploring pros and cons. Here we would be talking about it in the context of referral to treatment, exploring the pros and cons of actually going to treatment or going to an appointment, or making a phone call. So again, with, even though we, we would know there are many pros to seeking treatment that may seem very obvious to us, have, using those motivational interviewing strategies we talked about in part two, using the pros and cons and the decisional balance exercises um, that are available uh, uh, to you in the health professional's manual. We have a number of exercises you can actually send home with patients. We can use these same components to explore pros and cons related to treatment. And then action planning. So in this context around referral, you can action plan about the next step. Perhaps it's the action plan is to actually attend that first appointment where the action plan is to, is to take home a menu of options and talk over with their family what are the options. There are many different kinds of action steps um, that could potentially happen before actually someone actually goes because it's a, a very, it can be a very difficult decision. It can be uh, uh, financially difficult. And so there are a lot of steps uh, of actions um, that we can help people work through. Uh, even before they go, and, and hopefully if they are ready to go to treatment, we can help them form their action plan about how they're going to manage, this, manage the challenges or what are the potential barriers of actually uh, going and arriving to that uh, referral source. And then a commitment to action. A commitment to action in the context of referral is can we, in that conversation, motivate and elicit uh, with the patient statements around the desire to seek ad additional care, the, the, the ability to do that, um, feeling that, that need, that readiness. All the things we, we talked about around behavior change, you can apply those in talking about referral and gaining a commitment for someone to take action, whether it's a baby step or it's actually going to treatment 
all these elements can be used in the same way. So again, I would encourage you to revisit um, uh, part two and think about, well, how do I use these components in the context of having a conversation around referral? So we talked about um, identifying along a continuum the level of risk. And at a high level of risk, and we're going to take the audit screening tool, for example, a score of 20 to 40, you can see here that the level of intervention includes all those elements we just talked about. But the one thing that's different about high risk as opposed to moderate and low risk is that you'll see the consideration for referral to an addiction specialist for more intensive treatment is, would be um, uh, considered highly warranted at that level, unlike low risk or moderate risk. Although what I would also say is that for someone who's in that 17, 18, 19 range, those individuals are going to look different than someone who, say, is an 8 or a 9. And we really do need to use our, our clinical judgment as to the complexity of the case and whether um, referral to a specialist or intensive treatment is warranted. And uh, you know, your, in, your, your clinical judgment should, should certainly uh, trump these, these guidelines. What you'll also see here at the high level of uh, risk in addition to referral, we want to follow up with them and continue to monitor them. If you aren't able to follow up with every of all of your patients, which we understand is, um, is a resource issue um, and, and not necessarily warranted for everyone, we would want to see you begin to implement follow-up and monitoring, starting with the high risk and following those individuals over time whether it's uh, uh, an annual visit or it's following up with a, using a follow-up protocol that you're going to implement that's new in your organization, or looking at your existing operational processes, your procedures. Do you have uh, telephonic call centers that already do follow up with patients? Do health educators or social workers that you're working with um, that are uh, mental health or behavioral health cases do they already have a follow-up? And where can we integrate follow-up for ESPER into existing processes so we're not creating an additional process? But the cases that we would be focusing on would be these in the 20 to 40 range, and potentially those who are at that higher, moderate, high range uh, where there's a lot of other um, uh, existing information that you have on hand that your clinical judgment would warrant it. So we're really focusing in part three on, on, on that group of, of patients. And we talked about the motivational interviewing strategies. I've already highlighted for you some of the components of the brief intervention and, ex, and some of the, the motivational interviewing strategies we explored in part two. And I would say, you know, there are, you can use the same motivational interviewing micro skills that we discussed in part two. And I'll talk about what, just to remind you, refresh you on what those are. So we talked about motivational grief interventions. It's really um, that patients are much more likely to change their behavior if you use an empathic, client-centered, strength-based, motivationally enhancing style that's really focused on identifying and solving the patient's problems and, and building on their strengths listening and being empathic, being present in your conversation, um, focus on motivating them from helping them to realize um, uh, their own motivations inside and to articulate their own motivations to change. Well, it's the same concept when you're talking about referral to treatment or seeking treatment. We want to be empathic. Um, it's a difficult decision to seek treatment. It's we want to understand those challenges and be present with them and, and work with them on the ambivalence they have um, about moving forward with a treatment uh, option. And we want to remain client-centered, that really um, it's their option, their treatment option. We want to present them with options. But the, at the end of the day, we will guide them, but they 
can make the decision on which treatment option they want to try. And maybe they'll try several. But it has to be about what they're willing to do, what they want to do, and focusing, uh, too, on the strengths that they bring to that, that commitment to want to, to go to treatment or uh, the commitment to uh, engage and start at a mutual support group level, which is not treat, uh, treatment per se, but it's a supplement to that, and that may be the first step. And, and focusing and rewarding them and affirming them that it's a strength that they want to make a first step. And we hope in turn that will help um, to uh, be very uh, uh, motivating, but it helps them ultimately to solve challenges and in their lives. Uh, around alcohol use and, and reducing uh, harmful and hazardous use. And these were the micro skills that we talked about. And so I just want to refresh your memory that open-ended questions are, are important in eliciting information from people. So we want to have them as open-ended. You know, starting with things, well, tell me what you think about uh, seeking treatment or what are your concerns about seeking treatment, or what are your concerns about talking to your family about the need to go to treatment. So keeping in mind that is um, a motivational micro skill that can be very useful through the entire conversation. Affirming the patient. So when the patient is, is wanting to take the next step, to reinforce that and affirming them um, that and rewarding them positively with wanting to make that next step. And we want to weave in affirm affirmations all along the conversation, if at all possible. Reflective listening. We talked about reflective listening, not simply just repeating back what the patient says. It's important to re repeat back because it does help people move um, along a behavior change path by hearing what they've said to you. But reflecting back their um, desire to seek treatment or their fears of seeking treatment, reflecting back their pros and cons of why they would uh, seek treatment or not, just reflecting back and making sure that, the, that you're hearing the patient right, that they're hearing themselves can very, be very useful in motivating them to take that, that step towards that, uh, uh, that action plan. And then summarizing. We, we talked about summarizing the context of summarizing um, the patient's conversation around uh, behavior change, why they might want to cut back, why they may not, what are their concerns and fears or desires. Same way, we want to summarize um, uh, at, at some point in the conversation to check in with the patient that we have heard them around their, their, um, with what they're saying to you about uh, connecting to, to treatment. And then asking permission and giving advice. At any point during um, uh, providing referral, it's a respectful and rapport building thing to do to ask permission. So ask, asking the patient, would you like some advice about some treatment options that have worked for other patients? Would you like some suggestions or would you like some options to consider and look over some treatment options that you can take home and discuss with your family? Would you like, would you be, um, would you mind if I uh, called one of our, our social workers or health educators and, and had them come join us and we could talk about um, some of the treatment options. So just asking permission along the way, um, very uh, respectful in gaining and that trust and that connection with the patient. And then generating a menu of options. We talked in part two about generating options around behavior change options. This is generating options around treatment options and support group options, mutual support group options, options around educational resources, maybe online materials, lots of options for them to explore around, around treatment. And then managing pushback. You know, this is the motivational interviewing literature. It's been often referred to in the past as rolling with resistance. And this is sort of the new phrasing of that. And it's the same concept of man, when people are fearful of changing their behavior, fearful of, of or uh, of doing something, you, you, you can elicit pushback. 
or the challenges and the barriers may seem so monumental in behavior change that you get pushback. There are lots of other reasons why you may also get pushback. It's the same in the context of discussing treatment options and referral in that you know, there many people don't know what treatment is about. They don't know what the treatments are. They don't know what mutual support groups, the differences in mutual support groups are. They may become uncomfortable um, with having to process all of the information. It's kind of a new thing that they've encountered. This may actually be the first time someone's ever told them that they're at high risk, ever received a brief intervention, and are now is being suggested that they seek additional intensive services. You know, you can get pushback for a number of reasons um, in the context of referral, but again, it's about staying present and neutral and non-judgmental and understanding there's something going on that's making this person feel uncomfortable and exploring. Uh, it's an opportunity, really, to explore what it is that's concerning them or making them feel, uh, to, to give them that sense that they need to push back. So again, all of these are very helpful whether you're talking about behavior change or referral. And so I hope that you will go back and listen to, to part two and think about how can I use some of the scripting, some of the examples of the scripting that we provided in part two um, to talk about referral. And we're going to show you some of those today as well, just a sample of those that can help get you started in having the conversation. So let's dive into referral to treatment and follow up. So for those patients, again, the audit score indicates a need for a different level of intensity of treatment, um, and a referral is, per, is appropriate. And when I say referral, um, it, we're going to talk about a full menu of, of referral sources and options. And I also want to keep in mind that you may not be um, the same person providing the referral. So you have a multi component approach or a multi-practitioner approach where the patient is going through a process where they may have a brief screening uh, early on. It could be paper and pencil or, 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 or within a triage process. That person, that patient may have moved through the process and they received brief intervention by a nurse or social worker or health educator. And then they're then referred to uh, the physician or they're, the, they have a physician in, uh, encounter and the physician is providing, uh, is providing the referral. So you know, this is a, anyone it, along this chain, it could be the same person or different people, can uh, provide the referral. And so um, we're going to uh, present just a, a broad range of referral options. And I would say that some of the staff we find are, are more familiar with these different treatment options than others, and, and psychologists and addiction professionals obviously have a, a um, many of them have a more intensive knowledge of what those treatment uh, sources are. We're going to show you, um, for, for many people, they really don't have that level of, of knowledge. And we're going to show you some resources that can help you educate all different types of professionals, health professionals, on those treatment options and give you some tools for those who may be less familiar to help provide the referral. So of course we're assuming here that to some degree that um, the patient must be uh, agreeable to participating in treatment. And we, we hope that the use of the motivational interviewing strategies, we can, we can move people in, in to a point in the conversation where they are agreeable. But I think it's how you broach and discuss referral with the patient that really contributes to the likelihood of successful treatment as much, um, probably more so, than perhaps exactly what you say. It's that use of a non-judgmental tone, how you introduce it, introduce it. If you've built rapport, if you've used your motivational interviewing strategies, have you asked permission, all of those things really set the, con the tone for now el eliciting some uh, level of uh, agreeability or, or motivation to, to want to have this conversation with you and, and seek treatment. So referrals, I like to call them handoffs um, to a different level or intensity of treatment uh, than, you can, than you can provide. They're really uh, critically important um, and, and they're also very uh, risky because particularly when you're working with people with substance use problems. Because a failed handoff disrupts service delivery. 
and it introduces a lot of errors in a very, very fast-paced, busy environment. And sometimes, uh, many times, people do um, sort of slip through the, the cracks. Um, so it can be very disastrous for some, for some patients, and, that, and they may be the patients that are, are, are continually coming back with traumatic events or injuries or health issues. So the handoff is really, really critical, and the success of getting people to that next level of care and to um, the, their outcomes, ultimately their outcomes. So far too many patients are lost in the system during the handoff process from one level of care. In fact, about 16% of patients discharged from detox programs start a new level of care. It's a very low percentage. And only 30% of patient, patients discharged from residential care move on to a new level of care. And, and even only 50% of those who start outpatient uh, care or outpatient programs complete their regimen. What this says is that we, we probably haven't done a great job of, 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 of uh, implementing handoff and facilitating referrals with the level of care, and that we have really a real opportunity to help deliver people where uh, they need to be. And so for patients in that high-risk range, you may wish to suggest to the patient um, that they seriously consider more intensive treatment. So uh, you, wanna, you want to express uh, concern, and you want to offer advice, um, but you want to ask permission um, to, make these, to make these suggestions or, or to give advice about what those uh, treat, uh, treatment options are before actually doing uh, the handoff. So before you're connecting them with someone else, we want to make sure um, that we've, we've gone through that process of eliciting their, their um uh, permission to do that. And as, as you and your patient work to develop the steps of a plan, of, of a treatment plan or a care plan, um, different treatment options will come up. And, and, you know, patients have heard of something like AA, and patients may think that that is a treatment. Um, that may be the only thing they've ever heard. Or they've heard of, of a medication that may help them. They may not know a lot about it. But being well prepared on having the resources uh, in front of you and be able to share with them will give you the opportunity to really work through and educate them and help them work through what those treatment options are before picking up and, and making the phone contact before the next level of care. So getting their buy-in, getting their opinions or their, um, uh, their perspective on the treatment options before just picking up the phone and calling the first person on your on your referral list, because um, that may not be the kind of treatment they're really interested in. So we really want to engage them in, in this process um, so we know that it fits their situation. Insurance issues are concerns, transportation issues, all sorts of possible barriers. <clears throat> Someone may be working a couple of jobs and is really interested in something that's remote, or they may be in a rural or geographic area where they can't get to a certain type of treatment. So there may be states in which they have uh, remote kinds of support groups and, and other technology kinds of solutions that could help them. And having that conversation up front is, is important um, before actually um, making that, that next connection. So we want to be able to offer them that menu of options. And one or all of these could form a reasonable action plan. Um, they may want to start with one. They may decide they want to start with two different options. Uh, they may want to try several different things at the same time. Uh, but it could be brief treatment, a more intensive outpatient counseling, specialized intensive substance abuse treatment programs, uh, medication management, and uh, pharmacotherapy. Or it may be it's they just really want to start getting comfortable with, with this and, and working through um, uh, mutual support groups. So I'm going to pause for a second and, and, and have folks think about, well, what are the treatment approaches that you suggest? What is currently on your resource list? Who do you call? Is it someone inside the hospital? Is it someone outside the hospital? Are there, is it the social worker? And what's on their referral list? 
Is it an insurance sheet that has um, for different um, insurance carriers has uh, a 1-800 line? What what do you have available, and and what who could help you to enhance that existing referral list? What we often find in, is that many of them are outdated, or they don't include this full range of options. And there are some terrific uh, websites out there. The the uh, Colorado Expert site, Improving Colorado, and we can get you the full uh, web address for that. They have an online resource which is just uh, ask a couple of questions about what you know who they are, and not in terms of personal information, but you know, where they live, what they're in, what kinds of treatment they're looking for, and that will actually work them through uh, in in their area in the state of Colorado. What are the treatment options and resources available to them? You might want to consider looking for some online resources that are already existing in your state or in your in your location. Maybe the hospital already has some of these resources, or maybe you want to look at a a federal treatment locator, and I'll I'll show you, give you, provide you a link to that in a minute. But just this is a good opportunity now to think about how can I enhance what's not on my referral source. So when we look at different treatment options, uh, just as it's timing is important for patients to initiate treatment, what methods are used to introduce their options is equally important, and. One of the, the, the large uh, studies that's out there called the Mesa Grande study, and you may have heard of this, and we could certainly get you a, a reference to the full paper, looks at ranking the different types of treatment options out there from most effective to least effective. And when we looked at the number of studies looking at the breadth and the depth and the, the range of populations for which these treatment modalities worked, this is how the ranking worked out. Brief intervention, motivational enhancement, which is what we've been talking about, the, the use of motivational interviewing strategies, um, the uh, GABA agonists, the opiate antagonists, and social skills uh, training uh, and, and that in, treatment options that include that are ranked as the most effective. Now, those that were re ranked as the least effective included relaxation training, confrontational counseling, which is not surprising since motivational interviewing is a non-confrontational approach. Motivational enhancement is non-confrontational. Um, so it's not that surprising that it's at least effective. General psychotherapy, general alcoholism treatment, and educational lectures are least effective. So you might want to think about on your referral list the things that you uh, have the full range. Um, you make sure that you have um, options that, that go across, we hope, uh, those that have uh, been regarded as um, more effective. It's not to say that we wouldn't want to provide educational materials to people. We certainly would as a supplement. But it's what, what would we offer um, uh, to them in combination. And often multiple treatment modalities and multiple sources of support uh, actually lead to better outcomes. So we want to we want to make sure we have um, many dimensions and possibilities in our in our menu of options. So there's some important uh, important considerations for the referral process. We need to determine the specific needs of the patient in order to determine the most appropriate referral sources. The, ba the barriers and challenges I mentioned, the location, insurance their job situation, family situation. There are lots of things that we really need to understand um, to, to determine what the, what the referral source that might be the most appropriate and that they're willing to try. And evaluate whenever possible. Remove potential barriers to successful engagement with the helping resource. So we want to, if we can, work with our, our social workers, our, our health educators, our community resource folks, or behavioral health care providers in the community, community-based uh, organizations, who may be able to provide some resources. Maybe it's transportation. Perhaps it's uh, rem um, access to a remote um, technology-based program to help remove those barriers that are getting in the way of getting someone to that next level of care. 
We also want to explain to the patient, and in some cases to the family member, if appropriate and given your context and given the permissions and confidentiality um, considerations in your environment, um, we want, there may be family members uh, there involved and they have permission to, to engage in this conversation. But certainly for the patient, we want to explain in clear and specific language the necessity for and the process of referral to increase the likelihood that they understand what that process is and that they follow through with the referral process. I mean, there's nothing worse than getting, being given a, a referral piece of paper for a serious condition and not even understanding what the referral process is, um, what that treatment or that next thing that they just sent you off to do. They, have, you, they don't have any expectations. They don't know what it's what it's about. So if we can help give them information to increase the likelihood that they understand, that they'll follow through, work with some of the fears they may have, the more likely we'll have success in getting, in, in getting them there. Arrange the referrals to other professionals, agencies, community programs, support groups, and or other appropriate resources that meet the patient's needs. So if there are free resources and this patient really needs free resources only, we want to make sure that we're arranging with those professionals um, and making sure we're really cognizant of what is really potentially something that they can access and that they can actually get to. And we want to make sure that we're arranging the referrals. We're having someone in our organization help make the arrangement, not just relying on them to pick up the phone and call. Another consideration, the speed at which you can link a patient to treatment dramatically impacts their likelihood to show up, to stick with the treatment, and experience good outcomes. So the research shows that if a gap between your session, your patient encounter, and that first appointment for whatever that next uh, uh, level of care is, is more than 14 days, failure is virtually certain. And we know that in some communities, there are limited resources. And sometimes 14 days, in some, it, it may not be possible. And so being honest about that and saying, here are the resources. Here's what it usually takes. And as much as I'd like to get you into this resource within the next 72 hours or the next two weeks, what we know in working with these organizations is that it's going to take a couple of months. And I would like to be able to check in with you, follow up with you, check in with you between now and then, because we know it's difficult. So having an honest conversation when we know is really critical and important consideration in the referral process as well. There could be also a shortage of practitioners or treatment programs and being honest about that as well and saying we're going to do the best that we can. Let's check in. Here are some other treatment options. What do you think about this in the meantime and exploring those? So up to 50% of patients with serious alcohol or drug problems will not show up for the first appointment if put on a waiting list. So if there is a waiting list, then we, we have to be honest about that, and we also have to follow that same procedure I just talked about when checking in with them. Uh, at least we got them on the waiting list. Uh, but certainly the longer the wait time, the greater the likelihood of attrition. And someone staying connected them, to them with a phone call for a follow-up visit that they're coming back for is a way to keep them engaged in that process and not, and, and hopefully maintain some of that momentum and that con pre-intervention conversation that you had or that, that conversation about referral and, and, and that motivation to take that next step. We want to try to preserve as much of that as possible. So when you're exploring these different, uh, different treatment options that work, that they want to try, um, well, you may recall um, the, we talked about the use of um, rulers in part two around uh, how ready are you to change a certain behavior or to cut back, how confident are you that you could uh, take that next step, or how confident are you that you could cut back or reduce your drinking to one, one drink per day, how important is it to them to cut back or to do something differently to reduce their risk? Well, you can use the same ruler around their readiness to seek treatment. So 
so you can you can say on on a scale of zero to ten, from not at all ready to extremely ready, how ready are you to take that next step and 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 attend a mutual support group or to begin treatment? How ready are you to take that next step and begin treatment? How confident are you that you can take that next step? Or how confident are you that if you go to treatment that you feel like you can you you can do you can work through the treatment program? How important is it to you to go to treatment? How important is it to you to attend that first appointment. So we can use this as a pocket card for many, in many different ways. So I would encourage you, um, you can, you can uh, print these out and laminate them, or you could get copies made and laminated and make them into pocket cards. You may even contact Colorado Expert and see if there is a mechanism for uh, ordering some for your, for your location. But yet, yeah, certainly very, very helpful and exploring the readiness. And you can also use what, some of the skills that we talked about in part two around you know, when someone is feeling ready or feeling confident to reinforce using affirmation that, in, and, and, and saying, for example, if someone says there are six in their readiness or their confidence or it's important to them, you can say, wow, that's great. So you're, you're, you're pretty ready. And you're pretty confident that you can take that next step. And this is really important to you. So why are you a six and not a two? And again, building on their strength and helping them to acknowledge themselves that they are pretty high. Or even if they're a four, why aren't they a one? So helping them to acknowledge they have importance and readiness. There's something in them that wants them to take the next step. So for patients who express little motivation to go into more intensive treatment, using the readiness ruler, zero to two score, the primary task is really to in engage the patient in discussion that allows you to get to a good understanding of how the patient sees the substance use and explain um, her reasons um, why uh, not to choose uh, treatment. So you're, you know, in a non-judgmental way, exploring with them um, why they're so low, um, we wouldn't say that, oh, you're so low. We would say, okay, if they, if they say they're a two, why aren't you a zero? So we, we want to capture that moment of saying, well, there's something in you that's motivated. But you'd say, well, well why are you a two and not a one? Or what would, what, would, what would have to happen for you to go from two to an eight? So understanding, getting them processing through and getting them to explain um, why they're not ready or, or why it's not important, um, that's sort of the focus of, at that low level of, of readiness. So when the patient's hearing themselves describe their thoughts and their feelings to someone, um, you as a non-judgmental uh, listener who's established rapport and is, 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 is centered and, and present with them, this patient is more likely to understand that ambivalence is normal. You have mixed feelings or pros and cons uh, to doing everything, and uh, that may increase their level of motivation um, at some point. Maybe not right then, but it may be the next visit. They go home. They talk about it. They think about it. Uh, they come back. They talk to a different practitioner, health professional. Uh, but you're moving them along. You can facilitate the process, again, by using open-ended questions, making the empathic reflections, and using summary statements. And here's an example. So you're saying that you know that your drinking is causing the symptoms we've discussed today, but you've tried treatment programs in the past, and you feel like what, this is just another round of treatment. What is, what is it going to do for me? You know that drinking causes you to feel this way, but you just don't feel ready to commit to treatment. Is that what you're saying? Did I get that right? Something about hearing that back um, is a, is a, in, in that non-threatening way and reflecting and being empathic gives them a chance to think about, oh, I did just say that. And what does that mean? And it also gives them a chance to correct whether you actually heard, heard that right. You might ask, what would need to happen to raise their level of motivation? So 
uh, if the patient's initial response is something vague or noncommittal, like, well, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what needs to happen, um, you might try something like, it's hard to know what could happen that could make you feel more motivated for treatment. Sometimes people get more motivated because some things in their life get worse, like health problems or money problems or they have relationship problems. Sometimes people get more mo motivated to go to treatment because something good happens that makes it easier for them. Like they find out that they can get transportation there or their insurance will cover it. Do you, can you relate to any of these? So if, you're, if your patient is, is willing um, at that point in the conversation to consider treatment options, you can move to discussing some of the barriers to treatment and linkage to treatment. If your patient's not willing, you might close the discussion with a summary statement that conveys that the option is open for more intensive treatment or open for a follow-up conversation. For example, you could say something like, you're saying that you know that treatment can help people and has even been helpful to you and, and your and family members in the past, but you just don't want to go back to it at this time in your life because you, you don't feel ready to give up drinking yet. You feel like you'll you'll know when you're ready and you'll get treatment then. Did I get that right? For a patient who's expressing some moderate level of motivation, going back to the ruler, somewhere between three and seven, the primary task is to express some understanding of their ambivalence. They're on the fence and to elicit some change talk, a statement about change, something they want to do differently. And you want to listen for change. Sometimes you can pick up reasons for change, um, but you have to really listen intensely. They may seem very small or, or maybe not as consequential to you, but there's something that's coming through there that, that, that is it's really meaningful to them. And we have to really use our ears and our listening skills to pick up on some of that and to get them to express and elicit that, those change statements that will tip the balance, that, 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 that weighing the options and tipping the balance towards agreeing to treatment. And this can be done by exploring their ambivalence and expressing, again, that empathy and reflecting back to them, such as, tell me about some of the reasons why you would be motivated to go to treatment. Tell me about some of the reasons why you would not be motivated for treatment. So using reflections to express empathy um, uh, towards their responses and expressing empath empathy that they're on the fence, it helps them to understand that, y that you see this, um, this you know, decision, this ambivalence as normal. And norm making it m more normal to them and normalizing that people are, can, are, about, are in this place about many things in their life and as serious as treatment and we know that treatment is warranted and much needed, just being there and expressing that in that way and saying it's normal to feel, you know, two different ways about something um, can help them to feel more likely to move forward. So you can reflect back something like, so you're saying that, on the one hand, you want to go to treatment because you're sick and tired of feeling, um, you know, you're sick and tired of feeling grouchy, and you're tired all the time, and you really sound tired of that life. I see the way you light up when you talk about how you would like to be a better mom to your kids. So on the one hand, you, you know, you're sick and tired of feeling that way, and on the other hand, you you seem really excited, and that, and you see. Um, uh, it makes you feel good to know that you'd be a better mom to your kids if you got treatment. So you'll experience more successes by accepting the fact that the patient is on the fence and ambivalent and that sometimes the patient you know, will not feel like acknowledging the potential benefits of treatment. Uh, many people have a relationship with alcohol um, that is both social and both physical, there's a, there may be a physical dependency um, there. Um, and you, they know that this may be very, very difficult both uh, physically from the health, from health perspective of what they're going to have to go through physically. Emotionally, there's that a relationship emotionally, socially with alcohol and the role that alcohol is playing in their life. And just acknowledging that they're not ready um, can be a very 
powerful, um, be very powerful in helping people be okay with ambivalence and then helping them maybe when they leave, they, they start to process that more. But you were non-judgmental and that might, we hope, promote some success in the future, that we move them along the next time we have a, a, an encounter with them. But you always want to remain patient and express empathy, even when we know that absolutely treatment, 100%, is really what they need and they're not willing to go. And you can use double-sided reflections that include both sides of their ambivalence uh, to show that uh, the patient is understood. So you could use an example like, so what I'm hearing is that you don't really feel like going to treatment now because of how much work it is. And even though you think it would make things better for you and your family, did I get that right? You can ask questions that invite your patient to describe the potential benefits of treatment for those who are in that place, um, you know, and for those who uh, may be, uh, you know, more willing, regardless of where they are, but particularly for someone who, who may be not thinking and willing and, and maybe a bit resistant at time, you can engage them in, in a conversation to at least explore the benefits of seeking treatment. So how do you think it would affect your life if you did go to treatment? It sounds like you feel that going to treatment could help your health. Tell me some, some more about what makes you say that. For a patient who expresses high motivation, so this is at 8 to 9 on the readiness ruler, avoid trying to convince the patient that they're making a good choice because such a response could really run the risk of raising pushback in someone who's already motivated. Allow your patient to explain their reasons for their motivation, and you can affirm, you can affirm and be supportive of that motiv motivation um, and, and support them and help them uh, move forward. But let them articulate for you um, and, and let them hear themselves explain the reasons. So you indicated quite a bit of motivation to get treatment for your alcohol use right now. Tell me some of the main reasons for that. You mentioned some health concerns, but you also mentioned that you want to have a better relationship with your daughter, and you really want your daughter to not see you as, uh, as an angry, tired mother. And so t tell me some, some more of the reasons. Tell me more about those. Is that also related to why you want to get, get treatment? So if they give you many reasons around uh, health concerns or they give you a variety of social concerns, you can continue to play that conversation out and, and explore, well, what about those motivations? Why? What's related to those? Uh, what would be the positive outcomes they would get from doing that? And so they're then articulating to themselves what the possibilities are, the promise of the po possibilities of something positive coming out of it, and get them to and, and just ask them, how so? How would your life be different? So we've talked a lot about exploring their ambivalence, and we've talked about it's helpful just to say it's okay with the ambivalence. And, and to be okay uh, to talk about their reservations and, and helping them to feel comfortable with talking about their reservations. And the reason really to discuss this ambivalence is to increase the likelihood that these reservations that they have will, re will result in are not following through. So you can say something like, you're describing a lot of reasons why it would be a good idea for you to get treatment for your alcohol dependence. Sometimes, even when someone is really motivated to get treatment, they might have some negative feelings or concerns about doing that. How about you? So even if they're really motivated we, and they haven't talked to you as much about what the, the, the cons would be, we, we, when they go and move on to that next step, they're likely to encounter some cons or some negative feelings or, or something associated with with it, even though they're highly motivated and they want to go. And helping them, to, everyone, no matter where they are on that continuum of readiness and motivation, help them to be uh, aware that the negative things or concerns can happen um, so they're not blindsided. And having, processing that, at least some of the reasons up front, so, they're, so that when they do happen, they might be better prepared and not surprised that they're feeling these negative emotions. 
You want to support change talk expressing appreciation with the, that the patient is committing to doing something. Because we know it's not easy. We want to affirm that they have articulated that, that desire, the need, the action steps, the commitment, the motivation, and the confidence. We want to uh, show appreciation and affirm that. Because it's not easiness. And we want to thank them for being open and willing to take steps to, to, to uh, well, open and, and willing to talk to you about this not just their alcohol use, but actually the moving forward and doing something about it um, to, to improve their lives. And, and so we want to make, make sure that we stay present um, with them through that whole commitment process. And uh, one way of, of doing that is an example is, I appreciate that you've been so open in looking at the ways alcohol has been complementing things for you. Now you're planning to take back control of your life by going to, going to treatment or getting involved in a mutual support group. That's a really positive step you're taking, and I know it's not easy. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about this and, help, and letting me help you work through some of your options and, and helping you explore some of your options and, and helping you to connect with, with, a, with a support group or a physician who can help. Um, you explore medication-assisted treatment. There are many reasons when you're, um, that people uh, um, don't uh, end up uh, going to treatment. Uh, the number one reason that people who felt that they needed treatment um, but did not get it was cost. And SAMHSA studies have found that most, of, most often reported reason for not receiving treatment among adults and adolescents who felt they needed it um, and had actually made an effort to receive uh, treatment was really not being able to afford it. And we know that that's a problem, and, and we have to continue to look for um, low-cost, sliding scale, some free uh, uh, insurance uh, options are, are not always out there, although we have um, better options uh, now with, with, with parity than, than before in terms of our insurance coverage. But not being able to afford it is, is top of the list. And nearly uh, one in ten individuals that have health coverage that did not uh, cover substance use treatment at the time of this report, and 9% feared that seeking treatment would negatively impact their jobs. And I work a lot with um, uh, health professionals who work with working, working people, and confidentiality, just like in hospitals, is, is uh, very much a concern in the workplace, too, that if they were to seek care in a hospital and have an alcohol-related event, their insurance wouldn't cover it, they're in safety-sensitive positions, and they would get back to their workplace. And if they were suggested treatment, they went to treatment, their workplace would find out. There are a lot of fears um, that they would lose their job. And having a job is obviously very, very important in having a, a stability in people's lives. So when discussing treatment options, you want to explore insurance coverage, and many people aren't even aware that they have insurance uh, coverage. And you want to explore the concerns about their costs and how that might, um, and in some cases, how it might impact their job if they are in uh, working in, for example, uh, the, a nuclear regulatory environment or a Department of Transportation um, regulated, DOT regulated environment. We, you do want to explore all of all of these things, because that could impact whether they have um, insurance coverage or not as well, particularly if they lose their job. So discussing the resources that are free or having a sliding scale is useful. The SAMHSA online treatment locator and the National Helpline offers 24-hour confidential um, uh, every day of the year information in English and in Spanish for individuals and their family members for substance use and mental health issues. I provided uh, the numbers, uh, the telephone numbers and the links uh, for you to those helplines. They can also connect with um, providers who do sliding scale fee with community-based um, mental health centers, uh, community-based um, uh, agencies that may have support group meetings, uh, other kinds of community-based organizations. And uh, as well as uh, treatment, uh, treatment um, programs and facilities. Uh, and they can do that by geographical location. And so if you have patients 
and many hospitals do that, that particularly, and, and I've worked with um, hospital EDs that have lots of uninsured patients um, providing referrals to a local state office responsible for state-funded treatment programs is, is often the, the place that they refer first, as well as offer referral to facilities that, that charge on a sliding fee scale or accept Medicare and Medicaid. So when you're, we've talked about referrals and giving you some samples of how to have a conversation and exploring people's ambivalence, their confidence, how important it is, their readiness, at different levels of readiness, and how, um, and there are really some uh, good and bad examples of how to explore uh, the patient uh, in a brief intervention, the patient changing their substance use and the patient seeking treatment. And so I would point you to um, uh, Boston University's BNI uh, active referral to treatment um, uh, portion of, of their program. The videos that are available to you show the good and bad examples and are really terrific. And, and, and you'll, you'll recognize uh, some of the leading expert uh, researchers and program uh, implementation folks that are out in the field doing it. And they're really terrific in giving you some good examples. And if you're doing training in your own organization, these, and there are many others available on the BNI uh, website, uh, including their, their manuals. They have resource guides to give you examples of the kinds of resource uh, referral um, booklets that they use. You can model yours after theirs. Uh, all sorts of wonderful uh, information available from them. They also have um, other videos and they have training capabilities um, and so forth. And it's important to keep in mind when we're making referrals with patients um, that several principles of addiction treatment that um, uh, proposed by NIDA, which is that no single treatment is appropriate for all individuals. Treatment needs uh, to be readily available. Treatment must attend to multiple needs of the individual, not just the substance use. And multiple courses of treatment may be required for success. And that remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time is really critical for treatment effectiveness. And we talked about just, you know, helping the individual understand uh, what um, the different treatment options are, but what might be the general standard of course for referral? Um, just giving people um, a sense of what is the process, the flow for some, someone who, for example, is, um, you know, is uh, dependent um, and is, is considering intensive treatment and is going to go through the full range of standard course. You, you could usually you can show you can show something like this um, just to give them a visual of the process or you could just describe it verbally if someone is going to go through these steps or maybe they follow along someplace else in, in this um, uh, in this flow chart and it also just gives them a picture of okay well I might want to start with mutual support groups but oh look there's all these other options and okay so if I am going to go through detox, okay, so three to seven days, it gives them some a picture, something visual. Now we know that the standard course is not going to happen for everyone. We know the lengths of time vary, and people are going to come in in different places and, and flow in different ways. But sometimes this is just helpful to give them an expectation of what the process could potentially look like. So from the handoff, and delivering them to, and picking up the phone and delivering them to that treatment resource. They may, uh, into that specialty treatment services, uh, they may engage in medical uh, detox um, three to seven days, and from there may move into primary inpatient, which may range from seven to 30 days. Extended care, which would range from probably 30 to uh, 90 days of extended inpatient care. And moving to intensive outpatient, 9 to 12 hours per week for 12 weeks. Uh, from there, may move into transitional uh, housing or sober living for, for some patients in 30 to 360 days. 
And then um, it may be um, uh, one or, or, or both of these, outpatient counseling um, individuals, could be couples and, and family, marital therapy, recovery coaching. And on, on, on the other hand, it, it could also include mutual support groups, AA, NA, Smart Recovery, Women's Sobriety, Rational Recovery, Double, double Trouble, and so forth. And you may not be familiar with these, but we have resources to help you understand a little bit more about each of these um, levels of care, types of care, in our Health Professionals uh, Guide, our Learner's Guide, which is available from us. We also have available to you today more information on the mutual support groups. We have handouts that um, talk about the different support groups and also have checklists to help you determine which one might be the best fit. We also have uh, a wonderful webinar uh, that is available, and, and Misty is going to provide uh, a link to that, a webinar that talks about, it's from some leading uh, mutual support uh, group uh, folks in the field who talk about, well, what are the differences? And the, the webinar is free, and it's archived, and it does a super job of, of, of helping us to understand what are the differences, what are the underlying differences so we can help um, people make decisions about which mutual support groups might be the best for them to start out with. Also, there's a, a, a wonderful webinar available through, through NADAC, and Misty has a link of that as well, on medication-assisted treatment, one of the best webinars I've ever attended to really help you understand the different types of medication-assisted treatment as we can become more knowledgeable ourselves to help answer questions, provide the patients with an understanding of what is medication-assisted treatment. It's not just you know, taking, taking pills or it's not just getting shots or, and people have all these conceptions of medication-assisted treatment, but they don't, they don't know how it works. They don't make, necessarily make the connection to the brain science. They don't understand the differences. Does it help with withdrawal? Does it help with cravings? And, and going, that webinar, does a, does that series, there's a series of them actually, give a great understanding for us to help us articulate the differences and, and to help the, make the, com the patients feel more comfortable as they're making a decision about them. We also have as a handout, it's downloadable, um, for this uh, webinar that describes different medications. And it's, it's very nice, it's very handy to have on a, on a clipboard, it's something you can use and disseminate with your staff to help them become more familiar with um, medication and discussing medication. And this is what the mutual support group handout looks like. So it's a checklist and it's you know, just about a, a page, it looks like this. It's just the, the top half to give you a, a snapshot. And it, you, you ask people to check all that apply. And then there's guidance to help you uh, match the patient with the mutual support group um, that might be the best to consider first. And then in addition to that, we have available to you the contact information in the handout on what are the different mutual support groups. There are links and telephone numbers and addresses and so forth, and you can uh, encourage your, your patient to go on, online. Uh, so they're, they're traveling. They could potentially find a, a mutual support group meeting, for example, in their area when they're, when they're traveling. You can look up for them or have a, a nurse or a health educator or someone look up where the closest uh, meeting might be to their geographical area. So there's uh, resources there. You could actually use that as a, as a handout or a patient takeaway if you wanted to as well. And this is the medication uh, comparison chart that I was mentioning just a minute ago that can help you to better understand the, the, what is the, the treatment goal. I mentioned craving, so forth. What are the different medications that are out, out there? The, the, the dosage, the possible side effects, contraindications, and the relative cost, something very, uh, uh, very important considering medication-assisted treatment. It's also good to have some current resources available and handy to connect with finding a knowledgeable prescriber. And here are two go-to resources, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, AAAP, which is a collaborator in this 
uh, uh, training, um, one of our, tra our collaborating partners, their website, and ASAM, also one of our collaborating partners, they have a physician locator system. So if your patient's simply not interested in treatment uh, at this time, rather than, than push the patient and jeopardize those future opportunities I, I, I talked about, you know, when they go out of your office, what their thought process still may be thinking and considering, or they may arrive at another physician or health professional's office, and there's still that opportunity, and what they take away with them, um, we don't want to jeopardize that potential uh, gain that we had with them in building the motivation. So it's just important for you to accept and, and, and respect the decision in a non-judgmental -judge manner. And the patient may be more willing to accept the notion of treatment during a, first, uh, a future session, for example, um, with a, another health professional, or maybe they're seeking counseling about family issues or couples um, issues or something with their child, for example. They may be have the opportunity um, to explore with another helping professional or psychologist or something else that's going on in their life, they may be more motivated at that time. We don't know when that window of, uh, when that moment will be for them, but we want to plant seeds and, lead and, and end on a positive, um, a neutral, a positive but neutral note, accepting in a non-judgmental manner uh, where they are and being respectful to that. But we want to follow up with these patients. Um, particularly the patients at high risk who really do need treatment. And at your initial conversation, um, you, you could ignite some thoughts about change. And so that follow-up may be that moment of opportunity for you. It could be that future um, follow-up visit, or it could be the annual visit, or it could be uh, coming in for another, um, another health issue, for example. Um, but following up during those moments or creating a follow-up process um, could, could help lead to that, that, that change. So follow-up is we're going to be talking about, uh, about how, to, how to do that um, in a few minutes. But when we're talking about scheduling treatment appointments for those who are willing, we want to consider a three-way call, a warm handoff involving you and your patient and the treatment program or provider um, immediately after the patient consents to treatment. So if you can and seize that moment of opportunity and, and connect the person with a warm transfer, pick up the call phone, have the person in your office, have the physician or provider or a treatment program on the phone, a three-way call is, is, is optimizing the likelihood of helping deliver them that next level of care. Uh, it certainly could be a follow-up call that's done as a three-way call. It could be with um, it could be the physician that made the referral, and but the physician may not have time to actually do the follow-up. It may be a nurse or uh, a social worker or someone else. You could still, if you introduce the fact that you're going to do a follow-up and you're going to have a three-way call and a warm handoff, and you say that the social worker, Mrs. Susan Smith. We're going to be working with you and contacting you and following up with you, and we're going to help you make the connection to this referral source. And so she's going to set up a call with you and her and um, X, Y, and Z health provider. So if you plant the seed before the patient leaves, you could at least do it as a follow-up, but they're not surprised by this person, this other third person who's going to be connecting with them. And so the purpose of this call is to inform the treatment staff or the clinician of your, um, of your patient substance use. You can talk about um, uh, the results of uh, people are used, uh, patients are used to hearing about results of screenings and lab results and so forth. And so you could talk about the results of the screening and what you've learned and the conversation that you've had and that, this, that your patient is, um, is, is interested in exploring treatment options. And there are several barriers to that that, you know, we want to work with the patient and work with their with their program to see if we can find resources to overcome those, um, and you can you can talk to them about the, the ambivalence and the and sort of the pros and cons on that three way call of of making the connection and going to the, the referral source. 
you want to agree on the on whether the program or some other treatment option is best. So, you know, in that call is an opportunity to clarify if, if that if that program um, is not the best treatment option for them because it, it it happens to be that their office is where they see patients with you know that meet um, this criteria or insurance or so forth is 60 miles away. Um, that's an important consideration, and they may be able to help you find someone that's that's closer or another provider that's in their network or that works with them or does mobile assessment units or mobile mobile care units. And then other purpose of the call is to gain support from the program to resolve or remove some of the um, uh, gain support from the program and to solve or remove some of the treatment barriers. So we want to see if, if that on that call that that referral source can offer solutions to removing the barriers, can offer the resources. If we can get them to say up front that these are the things that we can do for you um, that will address these barriers, that will help the patient feel more likely like, okay, they're going to be able to help me and address my issues so I can actually get there or whatever the barriers may be. So having an understanding of what they can offer and what they can't offer is important. And if they say, I, I, we can get you in here, but we can't get you in here for three weeks, that's also important to understand what the time frame is, what's the wait list, things of that nature. And then schedule the appointment. We want to we want to walk away with a scheduled appointment time, date and time, and making sure that individual has that information. And having this call immediately would be fantastic, um, obviously, seizing the moment. But I mentioned, you know, having this call within three days of gaining the patient's consent um, is, is also, is also um, acceptable. Um, after that, what you, what you find is that no-show rate steeply climbs. And after 14 days, we say we mentioned that 50% that of the patients will not show for treatment, regardless of the motivation they were, they, were, they were sharing with you in the office. And making a referral that your patient does not um, reach wastes her time and yours. So that's what's really important to all these considerations and thinking about these things up front, because if they don't get there, you've wasted your time. They've wasted their time, uh, and they're not getting. And at the end of the time, at the end of the day, they're not getting the help that they need, and you're not uh, helping to deliver that patient where they need to be to prevent the things, uh, the the negative consequences that they, they they're experiencing in their lives and things that you discuss with them. And so, Gustafson, uh, Niatex rightly points out, we cannot blame the baton that is dropped during relay race. And so we should not blame our patients if they do not show up. Now, we do recognize that ultimately the patient's responsibility um, to change, um, to take action. But if, if we do make all considerations up front and do our due diligence to hand them off, to deliver, to engage, to motivate, to bring the three-way call in, if we do these things, um, and, and, and we, we still recognize people have to take responsibility, but we can't blame them just for not showing up because we handed them a piece of paper that said, here, go here, or here's a list of places, you know, go find a, a mutual support group in your area. So that's just the, the due diligence. So follow-up and support. So planting the seed around follow-up early during that first patient encounter um, when you've had the referral to treatment or, you, you're, or you've had a brief intervention um, and you're going to follow up with high-risk cases that maybe don't want to go to treatment, uh, maybe they're not ready for a referral, but just planning to see that you're going to follow up with them either in the next patient visit, the annual exam, or that you have another mechanism through another process we talked about earlier, whether it's the health educators or social workers or call centers, that there's a follow-up process that, that takes place and that you're going to, from, from that first patient counter, you're planning to see that it's a possibility that you're going to revisit this and that you want to to make sure that they're, um, they're, they're meeting their goals, they're moving forward and they're getting for, uh, to treatment, for example. 
And that's regardless of whether um, you know, they, uh, of the patient's decision about continuing to meet with you, regardless of whether they decide they want to cut down or not, um, even if they don't, um, we still potentially are going to plant the seed that we may follow up with them. And patients don't normally know what to expect, so it's often useful just to give them an idea of what follow-up would be, telling them you know, when you might follow up and that you want to you follow up with with patients who have complicated medical issues and who have who drink in, in, in at risky ranges, but possibly dependent, because you want to make sure that they're getting um, the right level of care and that it's important to you that they um, get the services that they need, even if they're not ready right now, and that that's what that's part of what your um, your process is in procedures or in working with your your patients. And few people will refuse. Um, in terms of getting permission to follow up, you ask permission. Few people refuse and say no, don't, don't, don't call me or don't ask me about it. Um, they may later on, but uh, certainly um, the probability is that very few will refuse. And follow up and support can take a number of different uh, forms, and it can be a couple of weeks um, after you've seen the patient. It could be longer. And you may be following up to see whether they're making change along that um, continuum of change. They uh, are cutting back. Ask them how things are going. Um, exploring, um, for example, um, the treatment resource, how that was going. They're connecting with an outpatient provider. They're, they're, they're going to an addiction treatment uh, specialist, addiction professional. You can explore how those things are, are going in a very brief conversation. And there are really two overlapping types of follow-up that are distinguished mainly by how soon they occur after the visit with the patient and how much information is collected. And one is a booster and linkage follow-up, and one is a recovery management follow-up. So booster and linkage follow-up can be very, very quick in nature. And uh, research studies have shown that a brief telephone call within a few days or a couple of weeks to a patient who received a brief intervention for risky alcohol use dramatically reduces alcohol intake and unhealthy drinking practices and alcohol-related negative consequences as well as alcohol-related injury. So it can be a very brief booster check-in call and it can be something that's very time limited. It's not something that takes, um, a, 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 it has to take a lot of time. You don't have to have a brief intervention um, in that conversation, but you're checking in. And it reinforces the action plan, just simply asking them about their action plan and specifically about the step of, for example, of, of going to the first appointment, the first treatment appointment or that intensive care, or going to the first support group meeting. And it demonstrates your concern for the patient's health and their well-being and that, that you're following up with them because it's genuinely important to them, that, to you, that they seek additional services. It reinforces that with them and it, and, and it continues to support that, that rapport and that, that, that patient-provider um, uh, uh, relationship that you have. And it gives you both an opportunity to resolve barriers or ambivalence about, um, about if that has come up, if they're feeling more ambivalent about going to that first appointment or they, they have a barrier that they didn't uh, foresee when they were talking to you, uh, you might be able to help get them some resources to resolve the barrier. And it gives you an opportunity to readminister the IFC if you wanted to. So if you want to see whether alcohol consumption has changed, you could do that very briefly in, in, in a, you know, 20, 30 seconds. Um, you could also, if you have a more intensive follow-up procedure that you use with patients, you can integrate the audit with those things. Some um, worked with some, some folks who are doing some call center-based work, and now they were really working with a depression management program. And they do call center um, follow-ups where they re-administer the PHQ-9 uh, for depression, and now they're integrating the alcohol screening into it because they were finding you know, that they want to pick up on changes in both, and they were comorbid in many cases. And so you can integrate them along. The same way you integrate them with early on screening, you can integrate and pair them with other tools in your natural follow-up procedures and with other programs within your hospital setting um, that are doing these, these kinds of things. Um, 
So making the phone contact, the follow-up are very brief and they're you know, no more than one to five minutes and again can be done by someone else uh, other than um, necessarily the same person who provided the brief intervention. Um, it would be great if the same person who either provided the referral or was told um, that here's a health educator, here's a social worker, here's someone, this is the person who's going to follow up again. So it's making the connection for them that this is the person and it can be very brief. I'm working with an organization now who has one person who's dedicated to doing um, follow-up and they're able to be very successful in evaluating their programs and looking at uh, change over time and how patients are doing um, over time by implementing a person who, who really manages that follow-up process. It may begin with a brief casual conversation, just a way to get reacquainted and it, it may be remind your patient that you had told her you had planned to follow up with her if for some reason they're surprised. But generally, they if you planted the seed, they know. So you could say something like, you may recall that when we spoke some time ago or when we met uh, in my office a couple of weeks ago, I stated that I would try to check back with you to see how things were going. Is this an okay time? Do you have any questions about why I'm calling? And again, confidentiality is obviously very essential and element of any outreach to a patient and, and organizations have their standard confidentiality protocols and procedures in place. So you may want to use those as a guidance for any kind of outreach these other departments are using. Often they can have already gone through that painful process of, of, um, of going, having legal review it and all sorts of other um, departments review it to make sure that it's uh, compliant. Um, so I would certainly suggest that you learn from what they've already done or, or, or help construct yours um, based on some of their guidance. Um, if, you, if you call and get a voicemail, you might say something like, hello, this is for Susan, uh, this is Dr. Smith or Nurse Leslie. I'd like to take a few minutes to speak with you. Please call me at this number between the hours of 8 and 4. If I'm not available, leave a message. I'll be sure to get back to you. It's my confidential voicemail. If I don't hear from you, I'll try you back. In, on Thursday. So again, you're not disclosing um, um, confidential information. If you reach the patient, you might say, hi, this is Nurse Leslie. This is, um, or you might say, hi, Susan, this is Nurse Leslie. I'm following up on a conversation we had on September 15th. This will only take a few minutes. Is this a good time to talk? Generally, people say yes, but people are very busy. They may say no. They, um, you know, very hectic schedules. But oftentimes, when someone from a, a health um, practice or a, a health professional calls, people are often will stop and pause to take that call uh, because it's it's regarded as likely very in, important. There's a reason why they're giving you a call related to their health or something that you discussed. If yes, you continue. And if no, you can say, okay, that's, that's not a problem. We can schedule an appointment to talk at another time. I'm available Thursday between uh, 12 and, and 4 Eastern. Which time would, would work best for you? If the patient does not agree to a time, you can say, I understand how hard it is to find a, a good time. Did you have any questions about why I'm calling? And see if they can, you know, they may make the connection because you planted the seed when they were there and say, okay, I'll go ahead and leave my number with you and I look forward to talking with you soon. And again, you might want to um, do just that kind of that, that quick check-in. If you have someone else who you want to, um, who, who can provide more brief intervention and have, use some of those same skills we talked about in part two to see where they are and in, in, in taking action and meeting those goals, integrating other um, uh, outcome measures. So if you're an organization and you're looking to evaluate your program and you're looking at, at track, uh, tracking patient change over time, you may have a variety of tools that you're already using. We've, we have some suggestions on some sample follow-up questions, uh, both in our health professional guide that's available, and also we have it as a handout for you today. And 
uh, as a part of that, that follow-up, and, and I'll show you some of the sample questions in, 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 just, in just a moment, but part of that follow-up, maybe that check-in, and maybe about those sample questions around health outcomes or, or progress they're making towards their goals. But it may also be something that happens um, further down the road that's more of a recovery management follow-up because this person has, has gone through treatment and uh, you know, this may be months after the last encounter with your patient uh, who's been through some level of intensive care. And really those kinds of follow-ups, these recovery management follow-ups, are, um, are, are reconnecting uh, to help assess that the, the patient uh, where they are in that uh, treatment process, or do they need additional treatment? Have they um, did, have they been able to resolve some of the barriers or other barriers that have come up during seeking treatment? See if there are additional services or recovery support services um, that can that can be made available to them, uh, and and so forth. So the, the conversation may, may be um, more about uh, recovery management, supporting them in recovery. It also gives you the opportunity to gain uh, feedback about your and improving your services and, 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 your S, and your referral to treatment handoff so you can get feedback whether your referral process and all your due diligence uh, was very helpful. Did it work? Was, it, was that a good referral source? Did they really come through in addressing barriers? It can help you learn a lot about the organizations and sources that, that um, that the patient actually had a real experience with, what their experience was like, and is that something you want to continue to refer to? And again, these can really occur, you know, um, uh, every three or four, four months. Um, it could be something that happens six months. It may be the patient is, you can't reach them for, um, you know, several months because they are in treatment and you haven't really, they're maybe in a different location and they've gone to a treatment program and you haven't had a one-on-one -on -one, one visit with them, but you could stay connected with a treatment provider or another physician in, in, in supporting their treatment and engaging them in ongoing care management. And we, in, in our health professionals guide, and we have a, a wonderful um, webinar about this topic is how do you work with physicians in ongoing care management? How do you use simple, straightforward, direct, concise reports to share information about the patient to stay connected so that you're getting information about how they're doing, they're getting information um, uh, about what you gleaned from the, the, the time you had with that patient before they went there. And it also creates that, that way of staying connected so that you know if they are getting, uh, if, if, if um, treatment um, uh, program is for X period of time and they're going to be moving, transitioning to another level of care, there, that might be the time to, to find a way to connect with them to make sure they get to that next level of care or to make sure that treatment provider is actually helping to hand them off and deliver to the next level of care. So we have a webinar that talks about that and it's working um, with physicians and ongoing care management and Missy uh, uh, will provide a link to that for you. So. There are, um, you know, many different um, goals for this kind of contact, and you know, you know, for, for many, it, it may be about getting them where delivering and the person where they need to be. It may be supporting them, just make sure that they're transitioning through care. It may be that we want to know whether we're measuring change, reduction, and consumption. I mean, you may not want to start if you're implementing follow-up as a new procedure it can be difficult to focus on all of those things. And it may take some just reflection on where do you want to start? Do you want to start focusing on just let's get and deliver our patients to the next level of care? That may be what you want to focus on. Or it may be that your your expert program also includes a large scale evaluation or maybe it's a small scale evaluation and you're trying to um, demonstrate the value of the services, the outcomes of your expert program. 
And so you may want to consider how do I implement the follow-up measures to measure change, alcohol, um, uh, reduction alcohol consumption, patient outcomes, and so forth. And uh, certainly I would say that um, if you're interested in evaluation and performance measurement and so forth, uh, right now we have a training and te technical assistance opportunity to offer you through uh, October. And we have some experts who really, that's their area. They can help provide some telephonic TA on how do you uh, evaluate your program, about uh, evaluation, about measurement, uh, all of those things that are really helpful in, in talking to stakeholders and your leadership to demonstrate why you um, um, should be doing this. And we can help you also provide the, the clinical and business case that you're, you're going to be presenting to your leadership as to why you want to do screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment, why do you want to do follow-up. Um, and, and then we can help you um, give you some technical assistance on how do you set up and document so that you can also look at the outcomes of your own program. So then you're, you would be going back to leadership to show them outcomes, not just from the literature, but from what your program. And so it does take some time and investment to do that. Uh, but you could start small with a, sort of a pilot evaluation to see you know, if we implement follow-up, if we implement referral, do people get there? And do they engage in treatment? Do they stay there? Or is our process or follow-up working? And, and do those patients, in turn, uh, have less 30-day readmissions, for example. You know, those are important outcomes. So uh, you can start small um, if you're interested. And so please let us know if you'd like some technical assistance in that area by contacting myself uh, or uh, Misty Story, who um, uh, can make her email available to you. And then here are the sample follow-up questions that uh, we're going to offer you as, as just some ideas of places to, to start. And, and these are, are looking at, um, you know, a one item on, on the use of drugs uh, um, other than for medical reasons, an item about tobacco, uh, emotional health um, comes from the PHQ-2 around feeling, um, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. You can pair those with the audit tool or the audit C tool. There are healthcare utilization questions that can help you um, with demonstrating the value and also looking at if, uh, the utilization of care by patients over time who are receiving um, uh, brief intervention and uh, other intensive levels of services. And these are just some examples of the handout that you can download. And we also have another um, one. If you like having the scripting available to you or you want to train other people or have it on your clipboard or um, someone's in a telephonic center or, or you have a social worker who's working with patients and you want something that's much more scripted out, we have a, a basic follow-up protocol using the Audit C to, to capture that booster linkage, what we call an administrative follow-up. It's a booster linkage. Did people get to their first appointment? Did they connect? Um, did, did they actually get on the wait list? So forth. We have a protocol that will walk you through the dialogue of how to have that conversation as well as the clinical conversation about their alcohol use or how, um, you know, how they're feeling about uh, going to treatment and how that work, how's that working for them, how to ask other questions, outcome questions, and so forth. And then we also have for you uh, several other resources. That was just a snapshot to get, again, of, of it. It's not the full protocol, but you can download it. Uh, this is the second page of it, and you can see it, it walks you through, if you do a brief screen during the follow-up session, uh, what to say, how to uh, use the brief intervention elements we learned in part two here, and how to provide some resources to support them in staying low risk or support them in cutting down on their drinking if, if, if that was their goal. And then we have another tool that we've used in a trauma center in the D.C. area. It's a flow sheet, a check, a, a front and back checklist sheet of sorts that really goes through capturing some basic information so that it can get mapped to the right, um, or the right person and documented in the file. And it walks through de delivering the screening tool. It'll even have a checklist that, uh, that's based on the flow, the FLO um, flow checklist developed by Chris Dunn and Craig Field. And 
that's just a nice front and back that helps to remind the health professional what the elements of that follow-up are. And here's a, a, just a snapshot of, of, the, of the lower half and the back part of that follow-up protocol. As you can see, it's very simple. It walks you through how to open the follow-up conversation and what, what, what to say or to note um, as to why they may have refused, although we find that doesn't happen that often. You identifying your roles. You can see that also prompts you to, um, uh, to, to remind the patient of the goals that they had set previously to reaffirm their commitment to the goal using that uh, readiness ruler, what we call the commitment ruler, and then uh, offer them some additional referral sources and so forth. So it's just a nice, simple way that you can also use not only to capture the information, remind you of the things that you want to touch on, but you can use this as a way of collecting data and information if you want to evaluate your program to see whether it's being implemented the way you designed it. And we could provide this to you in a, in a, in a Word document. So if you wanted to, to tweak some of it to reflect more of your processes, uh, we could certainly do that. So in conclusion, uh, wrap up um, this series. And hopefully we've uh, highlighted that 35,000 uh, feet view, uh, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, including the follow-up process. Uh, how to use the motivational interviewing strategies, whether you're talking about behavior change, moving people along the readiness, cognitions, their thoughts, their processes about making a change, or taking action and, and going to treatment um, or linking with uh, another uh, self-help group. Uh, we hope we've at least given you some rich information that you can uh, begin or enhance what you're currently doing across all of these uh, different components of SBIRT. And there are many more uh, rich information and resource materials available in the Health Professionals Guide than we could possibly cover in our three-part series. And I would um, you know, just say to contact me if you are uh, interested in that, in that uh, getting a copy of that. And so I want to thank you very much for listening and for listening not only to, to this part three, but a part one on screening and part two on brief intervention. And I hope that you will join us for uh, our upcoming webinar series, including uh, many that are archived and already available to you now. And here is the links to the archives for those in this particular series but also a complete list of webinars. You can link to the archives at this uh, uh, web address, the hospitalexpert.webs.com forward slash webinars. In fact, we have another webinar coming up uh, tomorrow, September the, the 28th, uh, by uh, Dr. Goplerud. And if you have not received a uh, link to register, I'm sure that Misty will be uh, making available on the web, and I'm sure it's already up, a link to register for that, um, uh, that uh, webinar, which is focused on uh, the joint commission measures. And we'll have some of our technical assistance and training experts um, from our project speaking about their own personal ex experiences and what they've gleaned from implementing programs in various parts of the country. So we're going to close the webinar and we will uh, open it up for some questions and hopefully some answers. Thank you, Tracy.